Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer before we continue. Father, we thank you for this workers' training tonight. Thank you for calling us to serve you. And we thank you for the desire, the passion, the, the consecration to keep on serving you. We pray that our service will not be in vain in Jesus' name. In all conditions and at all times, whatever the circumstance or situation, we pray that the desire to serve you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, all our skill, you give to everyone in Jesus' name. Physical condition will not hinder us. And a communicable condition will not hinder us. And the community will not hinder us. And the state in which we find ourselves will not hinder us in Jesus' name. More power for everyone. More anointing for everyone. And more dedication for everyone in Jesus' name. Lord, speak to everyone tonight again, and this passion of your soul, and this desire in your heart, you pass to everyone in Jesus' name. Give us the mind of Christ, the vision of Christ, and the passion that will go out and reach out to those who are lost in Jesus' name. Use us for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And the people of God said, yeah, don't say many like you are tired, like you are wondering, we're here again today. The Lord bless you. And the Lord enrich your life. This work will prosper in our hands together. God bless you. Can see that. We're looking at John chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 40, 41, and verse 42. John chapter 1, reading from verse 40. And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first findeth his own brother, Simon, and says unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and he brought him to the Messiah, and he brought him to the Savior, and he brought him eventually to salvation, and he brought him eventually to the supply of God, and to the supply of Christ, and to everything Christ will be and do for him, and brought him into service. What a work, and what an assignment. The Lord started with those people, and it continues till today. And we must not allow the chain to be broken, because Andrew did his part, brought Peter. Peter brought, did his part, brought others. Those others did their part, and they brought yet others. And it has continued until today that somebody brought you. But it's not just that they brought them physically to the Lord, they were bringing them to salvation. They were bringing them to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They spoke with assurance and they spoke with confidence. We have found him. And we found him according to the scriptures. And what we have found is exactly based, is exactly built, is exactly embedded in the word of God in the scriptures. The one that has been spoken about as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the one that will come and save us from our sins, we found him. And we, we can tell you that this is the Christ. And he spoke so convincingly. He spoke so persuasively that without any argument at all, Peter followed and, brought, and he brought him to Christ. That's what the Lord wants us to do, to bring people to Christ, bring them to the Savior, bring them to salvation, bring them to real conversion, and bring them to Christian experiences so that they abide in the Lord 
and not to leave them alone until they are brought into the service of the Lord. Look at that verse 42. And he brought him to Jesus, the Savior. And he brought him to Jesus, the Sanctifier. And he brought him to Jesus, the Supplier of all our needs. And he brought him to Jesus, the Author and the Finisher of our faith. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, when he brought him to Jesus, he didn't stand between him and Christ. He didn't make himself uh, the person that Peter had to consult every time before you see Jesus. There are people that stand between the Savior and the convert. They stand between the sanctifier and the child of God. They stand between the Messiah Christ, the one that can do all things for us, and they stand between them and the Lord. But uh, Andrew was not a, a kind of a obstacle. That after he brought him to Jesus, every time you want to see Jesus come to me and come through me, he brought him to Jesus, connected them together, and they were together. And then it says in verse 42, And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonas, Thou shalt be called Severs. There was a change. He changed his name because he was going to change his nature. This is the outward manifestation, outward demonstration. I'm changing your name because I'm changing your nature. I'm changing your name because I'm converting you. I'm changing your name to show you, to demonstrate to you. A change is going to take place when you are connected to the Savior. When you are connected to the Lord, you are now Severs, which is being interpreted a stone. I want you to be solid as you come to me. I want you to be steadfast as you come to me. I want you to be stable as you come to me. I want you to be dependable as you come to me. If you have been here and there, rolling stones that gather no more. If you have been here and there, weak like a balloon. Like you only look big, but there's air inside you, and you are empty on the inside. Now that you come to me, I am transforming you. I am making you another personality. And he called him Sivas, which being interpreted is a stone. That's what the Lord is expecting of you and I. That we, first of all, must find the Savior. We must come to the Savior. And after being touched, after being transformed, after being renewed by the Savior himself, and he makes us solid. We're saved, and he makes us steadfast. We're sanctified, and he makes us saturated with his grace because of the Spirit of God indwelling in us. Now we can go out to other people, and we can tell them, the way we talk, they know we have found something. And the way we position ourselves, they know we have found something. The way we interact with them, they knew us before. And they knew that before we were empty, we were vacillating, we were not sure of anything. But now we come with courage and confidence. Conversion has taken place. The way we talk to them, when we say we found Christ, we found salvation, we found redemption, they know we've got something. Thank God I got something. Somebody there said, I got something. And so when you talk, the courage with which you speak, the confidence with which you speak, will tell the people, this brother got something, this sister got something. We found Christ, the Messiah. We found Christ, the Savior. We found Christ, the only name that is given under heaven, whereby we can be saved. And then they'll follow you, you'll bring them to Christ. Give me a good amen over there. Not only bringing them to church. There are people who bring people to church, but one year they are not saved. And they just say, are you still coming? Are you still coming? Yes, I'm coming. Yes, I'm coming. And they are not born again. 
bring them to conversion. Let them know Christ in a personal experience. Uh, why are we bringing them to Christ? Because we want Christ to link them with the Almighty God. When you bring them to Christ, look at what Christ will do in First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, and I'm reading here from verse 18. First Peter chapter 3 verse 18, for Christ also as one suffered for sins. That's why he's Messiah. That's why he's Christ. That's why he's Savior. That's why he's Sanctifier. He has one suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. That he might bring us to God, the God of all grace. That he might bring us to God, the God of peace. That he might bring us to God, the God of power. That he might bring us to God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Bringing somebody to Christ, when that person actually is in the hands of Christ, Christ does something. Christ saves him, forgives him, and presents him to God, that he might bring us to God. God, in that uh, verse 18, uh, being put to death in the flesh and quickened, uh, raised up by the Spirit. Look at Hebrews. You bring somebody to Christ. What next? You bring somebody to Christ. What's the result of that? Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, and we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. Look at this, look at this. But that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. When you bring somebody to Christ, let that person understand. The soul that sin it, it shall die. And we have all sinned. And the wages of sin is death. You should have died for your sin. But Christ is your substitute. Christ is your savior. Christ is the final sacrifice. Now he has tasted death for you. Your death penalty he has taken away. And let that person be convinced. Let that person understand. Because I am brought to Christ. And I repent. And I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I will not die anymore. That eternal death is taken away from me. You talk to them. It's not just come to Christ, come to Christ. Yes, we we'll come to Christ. Who is Christ? What does Christ do in our lives? What has he done on our behalf? We tell them he has tasted death for every man. Look at verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things. And by whom are all things, look at this, look at this, in bringing many sons unto glory. In bringing many sons unto glory. Bringing somebody to Christ, conversion, repentance, regeneration, adoption into the family of God, being born again is the first step in the journey towards glory is the first act in his progress towards glory so it is not okay i've evangelized i brought him to christ saved he has repented he's now a child of god does he stop there many people stop there but we're to follow through the process and we're to follow through in progress towards glory. Look at that verse 10. In bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. And let's come to Luke chapter 14. I'm reading from Luke chapter 14. Reading from verses 22 and 23. Luke chapter 14, verse 22. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. The Lord gave a parable. 
that the servants were sent out. They were to call people from every walk of life. And they were to bring them into the banquet of the Lord. And the servants went out. And this servant came back and said, Lord, we've done it. We didn't sit back. We did it. We didn't close our mouths. We did it. We didn't go to hibernate somewhere. We went out. We did it. We are not lazy. We went out. We did it. How many people have come week after week to this training? And then the Lord has given us instruction, commandment. And he has told us what to do. And then we go from the workers' training. We go back home. Then we come the following week. Hear quite a lot. Go back home. But these servants said, Lord, we heard you. We learned from you. We accepted what you said. We worked on what you said. We have done it. And then it says in verse 23, And the Lord said, The Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and edges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. The house still has a lot of seats, and the house must be full, and the people are still there. They are hungry for the bread of life. Compel them to come. They are, they are thirsty for the water of life. Compel them to come. They are tired of, the, of living in sin. Bring them to the Savior. I don't let anyone say, I'll try another time. I'll come another time. I'll think it over. Just now, it's not convenient for me. Just now, it's not the moment I can take a decision. Compel them. So speak that you compel them. Talk about us. Talk about heaven. Compel them. Talk about us. Talk about hell. Compel them. Talk about the danger of delaying. Compel them. Talk about those who have delayed and they perished. Compel them. Talk about the fact that what they are now and what they are doing now is not sufficient. Compel them to come in. As we do, the Lord will bring souls into the kingdom in Jesus' name. And these souls that they are brought to the kingdom, they will come to Christ. They will not just come to church. Yes, they will come to church, but they will come to Christ. They will repent. They will be born again. A new life will come in them. And then they continue with the Lord. Don't forget, they start from grace. They go through godliness until glory. Tonight, we're speaking on the subject, the burden of bringing precious souls to the Lord. The burden of bringing precious souls to the Lord. Point number one, recovering the purpose of laboring as watchmen. Point number one, the recovering the purpose of laboring as watchmen. That's our calling. That's the duty. That's the responsibility. That's the essential work we're supposed to do. All the other things we do in life, note this, they to keep soul and body together for the purpose of doing the essential thing. The work we do, that's not number one. The number one is to be a watchman. The number one is to bring souls to Christ. The number one thing in our lives is to make Christ and his commission the number one essential thing, indispensable, non-exchangeable, not exchangeable in our lives. That's number one. Every other thing we do is so that we can do this major thing properly. Do we sleep? Yes. Why do we sleep? To recover strength so as to do the work. 
do we eat? Yes, we do. What do we eat? So as to do the work, the number one he has called us to do. Do we go to work and do we earn money? Yes. What do we earn money? That we may be able to take care of ourselves and put ourselves in the proper place and strength to do the work of God. The number one thing is laboring for the Lord. And so we need to recover the purpose of laboring as watchmen. Come to Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 17. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 17. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Son of man, Ezekiel, whatever your parents make of you, is so that you will do this one that I'm calling you to. Whatever society thinks of you, and society is giving you this chance and this chance, is to train you up, is to make you available, is to give you the interaction and connection with them so that this one thing will be done. Do you ever see yourself like that? Or do you see, number one, my academics? Number one, my profession? Number one, my job? Number one, my happiness? Number one, my health. And then after that, if there is time, I will do this. No, you got it wrong. Seek ye for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. After that, all the other things will follow. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth. That's your number one responsibility. You cannot just be jumping up and down, going here and there, without remaining in connection with me. Hear the words at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, that shall surely die. When I say unto the wicked, the wicked man we're talking about may be a man of power, a man of position, a man of authority. A man who is cruel, a man who is fierce, a man that everybody fears because of his manner of life. But when I say to that wicked man, I give him warning, and I say to him, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, I'm looking at his sight, and thou givest him not warning, I'm looking at his posture. And thou givest him not warning, I'm looking at his position in society. And thou givest him not warning, I'm thinking of what he might do against me if I tell him, wicked man, you are going to die. And thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way. He's telling us that when God raises you up and he sends you forth, and he says, here is my word, the word of repentance. Here is my word, the word of salvation. Here is my word, the word of the gospel. And he says, go tell them. You're not to look at their faces. You're not to look at their language. You're not to look at their disposition. Tell them. He says, you'll tell that wicked man and warn him of his wicked way to give him, to give uh, to, uh, and uh, he shall die in his iniquity. But if you do not warn him, he will die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at your hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from the, his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. I pray the responsibility and the duty the Lord has given us will do it without fear. Will do it without uh, shrinking. And will do it without turning back in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at verse 20 again. When a righteous man does turn 
from his righteousness and commit iniquity. And I lay a stumbling block before him. He shall die because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin and his righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thine hand. I hope you underline that verse in your Bible. There are preachers who say they believe eternal security. There are preachers who say they don't give anyone into a real believer. He's born again. He has grace in his life. He raised up his hand. And whatever he does now, I'm not going to talk about that. They say God does not see him anymore. He doesn't see his sins anymore. All he can see is the glory of God, the grace of God, the covering of the Lord, the propitiation of the Lord, the atonement of the Lord upon him. So I don't want him. God said, Ezekiel, son of man, you'll want the righteous man. If that righteous man turns away from righteousness and he says, I'm eternally secured, I don't need warning, I don't need preaching, I don't need teaching, I don't need to be coming and coming to the house of God every time I know enough. If he goes back to sin and he dies in sin, he'll go to the other side. I pray that will not happen to you. That will not happen to your convert. We'll keep on talking to everyone so that we'll not be guilty of the blood of anyone in Jesus' name. In verse 21, Nevertheless, if thou want the righteous man, that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin, thank God we can live above sin. I, th I said, thank God we can live above sin. We can so have the grace of God, the strength of God, the vision of God, the mind of Christ, and we can so have the presence of the Lord in our lives and we remain righteous and we sin not. God will give you more grace, more strength, more ability. Every temptation that comes, you'll say no in Jesus' name. How are you going to say that no when temptation comes? Let me hear it from you. Say that again. Look at that. Imagine and visualize uh, that uh, tempter, that temptress. How are you going to reply them? No. You will not fall into their hands in Jesus' name. It says, because he is one. That's why he will live. And also, thou hast uh, also delivered thyself. That's the commission the Lord has given us. That's the responsibility the Lord has given us. And we're going to do it in Jesus' name. Look at James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Our duty. Our responsibility. What the Lord has committed into our hands. We need to recover that purpose. is so that they come out of sin. They come out of their evil. And they come out of their iniquity. They totally repent and they abide with the Lord. And the grace of God becomes more multiplied in their lives. We're looking at James chapter 5. I read from verse 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, if any of you do err from the truth, okay, James, what's all about that? If they hear from the truth, they were in the truth before. Have we, have we not been told, once in the truth, always in the truth? Once in Christ, always in Christ? Once saved, always saved? James says, no, by the Spirit of God. And he says, brethren, if any of you, a brother or a sister, do you hear from the truth and one convert him, Somebody has to go to him and convict him of his backsliding and get him converted, restore him and come back to the Lord again. And one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner, in verse 19, he was a brother, he was a sister, brethren, any of you, 
when he turned away, he became a sinner. Now he that converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. That's what the Lord wants us to do. That's what the Lord did when he was here. We're looking at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. You know the Lord Jesus Christ, it wasn't like, do as I say, but don't do as I do. He laid the example. He set the standard. He demonstrated what his followers were supposed to do. And they're not preachers who just say, and they don't do. They send others. They don't go. They tell others to evangelize. They don't evangelize. They tell others to read the Bible. They don't read the Bible. They tell others to pray. They don't pray. They tell others to be faithful to the Lord. Be committed to the Lord. They are not faithful. They are not committed. But look at what Jesus did in Luke chapter 19. Reading from verse 6. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. That's Zacchaeus that came down and received the Lord. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. You know what had happened there? A transformation. A change. The man was stingy. But now the stingy heart had been released. Now he said, up of my goods I give to the poor. The man was self-centered. The man was selfish. The man was only thinking about himself. The moment he came to Christ... Are you bringing somebody to Christ? If you have truly brought them to Christ, a transformation will take place. Salvation will take place. And the man said, Now half of my God I give to the poor. Not only that, if I've taken anything, anything, anything from any man, the man may not even know that I cheated him. Any man, the man may be a poor man, he doesn't have connections. He doesn't have anybody who can arrest me for what I've done. Any man, the man may not be part of the who and who in society, but I cheated him. I oppressed him. I took something from him. Unlawfully, in a way I shouldn't. It was illegal. I'm going to restore it to him Fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. When you bring people to Christ, let them have such connection with Christ, conversion from Christ, that salvation that can be confirmed by the Lord will be theirs. It says, For as much as he also is the son of Abraham, for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what Christ did. What are we to do? That's the example of Christ. What are we to follow? That is the purpose of Christ laboring. What's our own purpose? Look at verse 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, what did he say to them? Was he saying to you? Was he saying to you, Occupy till you are tired. Occupy until you retire. I can't hear my people. Occupy until when? Until I come. Until I come. The Lord will strengthen you. The Lord will empower you. And the courage and the conviction to keep on doing it until he comes for you. To take you to heaven. That courage and conviction the Lord will give you in Jesus' name. 
He says, Occupy till I come. Lord, I will. Lord, I will. That's a promise before the Lord. He'll give you the grace to be faithful to the very end in Jesus' name. In Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, and I'm reading from verse 45. Luke chapter 24, verse 45. It says in verse 45, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. And said, unto, and said unto them, Thus it is written, And thus they behold Christ to suffer, And to rise from the dead the third day, And that repentance and remission of sins Should be preached in his name. That's what he told us to do. That's the purpose of our laboring. That's the ministry he has given unto us that we are to preach repentance and cleansing from sin, remission of sin, pardoning of their sin, conversion from sinfulness that should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Those who have gone before us, they did it. We are going to do it. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere. What were they doing? Gossiping? I said, were they gossiping? Were they just commenting on the national news or whatever? What were they doing? That's what we should be doing too. And we should give our time. We should connect with people. We should touch people's lives. Everywhere we see people, they should be the passion of our soul. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Acts chapter 26. In Acts chapter 26, I'm reading from verse 16. Acts chapter 26, verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. This is the purpose of living. And the moment Paul the Apostle Saul at that time met the Lord, the Lord said, this is the number one thing in your life now. This is the essential thing in your life now. This is the effort and this is the thing that carries the day, every day in your life. Because it is for this purpose I have appeared unto you. You might think there's something good going on there. Can I get involved? I didn't appear to you for that purpose. There is another thing in the village. There is something in our tribe. In fact, they want to make me the chief uh, in our tribe. I didn't appear, appear to you for that purpose. This is the one single purpose I appeared unto you. To make thee a minister and a witness. Both of thee of those things which thou hast seen. And in those things in the which I will appear unto you. Delivering you from the people. He will deliver you from the people. Go to them, they will not hurt you. Go to them, they will not harm you. And anything they do will not cut your life short by one single minute in Jesus' name. Delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles and unto whom I now send thee. What are we to do? What was it to do? What's the purpose of the calling? And what is the reason he brought you into the kingdom for such a time as this? Look at this. To open their eyes. The blind. Then the dark. The religious, but you don't know the way to salvation. They go to a church denomination, but you do not have the understanding of what it takes to be saved. Open their eyes. To turn them from darkness unto light. 
and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. That's where they start. They must be convinced they're sinners. They must know the soul that sinners, it shall die. And they must understand they need forgiveness from the Lord. They need the atonement of Jesus Christ. They need conversion from their way of sin unto salvation. And not only that, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Christ was talking to him, the me there is Christ. Sanctified by faith in Christ who was talking to him. Look at the testimony of Paul the Apostle, verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. You will not be disobedient to the heavenly vision. You will do this work. You will labor purposefully. You will labor passionately. And you will labor profitably in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. A good amen. amen. Point number one, recovering the purpose of laboring, laboring as a watchman. As an individual, recover the purpose. As a family, recover the purpose. Once again, can I ask you a question? Personal question. Why did you marry? You know why you're married? To have a help meet for you. Already you had an assignment. Adam had an assignment. But he couldn't carry the assignment out all alone by himself. I will make him and help meet for him. That's why you got married. This work the Lord has given you. That you're a man, you're a woman. You got married. That your spouse, your husband, your wife will assist you. Not in another thing. Not to distract you. Not to derail you. Not to turn your face in another direction. Not to start something you know, that God has not appointed for you. The purpose of you having a family is so that your spouse, your partner, your companion will join you. And you will do this work. That's purposeful living. And what's the purpose of the church? The Palai Bible Church? What did God raise us up? I would like to be another denomination like other people. This is what denominations do. This is what assemblies do. Are we to follow them? We have a purpose. The purpose for which the Lord raised us up. For this purpose have I appeared unto you. We are to reach out and there we can say like Paul the Apostle, King Agrippa, we have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. We will not be disobedient in Jesus' name. Point number two now, reviving a passion. Reviving passion for the lost among women. Re reviving passion for the lost among women. The Lord also has given challenge, commission, the great commission to the women. And we need to understand that we are to revive that passion among women. We are coming to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. I'm reading here from verse 1. In Matthew chapter 28 verse 1, it says in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to draw uh, toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene, a woman, and the other Mary, a woman, to see the sepulchre. Look at verse 5. And the angels answered and said unto the women, Unto the women, fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified, is not here, for his reason, as he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly. The angel said, you don't have any other thing to do now. Christ who died, Christ who was buried, and Christ who rose from the dead is not here. Come and see the empty sepulchre 
What are you to do now? What's your responsibility now? You've seen it. You've known it. The resurrection of Christ. And you have known it that he came to do the work of redemption. It's done. And now you women go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Go and tell your neighbors, sisters. Go and tell your neighbors, women, that Christ rose from the dead. And the reason of rising from the dead is to justify us. It's to forgive us. It's to affirm our salvation. It's to bring us unto God. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. And there shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. And they, the women, departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy. And did run to bring his disciples' word. They ran with the message. And they went to do what the Lord, what the angels had commanded them to do. Come to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 4. Acts chapter 1. We're reading from verse 4. Hear what Jesus said here. And being assembled together with them, <clears throat> commanded, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, ye have heard of me. For John truly really baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. There are people that in their lack of understanding, they thought Jesus was talking to only the twelve or the eleven apostles. No, not at all. He was talking to all the people that saw him, men and women, the converts, disciples, his followers, after he rose from the dead. What did he say they will have? Verse 8, but he shall receive power, not only the apostles, all those disciples, men and women, he shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, all of you, which in Jerusalem receive the Holy Ghost, receive the power of God, men and women. And then he said, ye shall be witnesses, men and women shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Verse 14, in verse 14, And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. The women were also waiting for the Holy Ghost. The women were also waiting for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren, all of them, about 120. In chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, all men and women, all male and female, all young and old, all those people that heard, ye shall receive power. They were all waiting, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and they and there appeared unto them, clubbing tongues like as of fire, and it sat on each of them. And sometimes you see a picture uh, depicting or showing uh, the day of Pentecost. And you know what uh, the artists do? They draw the picture 12 men or even 11. And you see symbols of fire on them. As if only those 11, only those 12 received the power of the Holy Ghost with fire. But all of them, all the 120 men and women, and they were all 
men and women filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What's the expression of the Apostle Peter concerning what they got, concerning the experience they received? Look at verse 16. In verse 16, here is Peter now talking to the crowd. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters, sons, yes, daughters, yes, the men, that's true, the women too, that's true, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall dream, shall, shall see visions, and your old men shall see, shall dream dreams. And on my servants, men, and on my handmaidens, women, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and they shall prophesy. What about that? It's not just them. Um, like uh, sometimes uh, women, thank God for our uh, women, our uh, sisters, Mothers in the Lord, sisters in the Lord. But you know, sometimes they have all this uh, meeting uh, at, um, you know, a specified time. Uh, and it's to teach us how to make this and make this. And it's to teach us how to weave this and weave that. All that is good, but that's not the purpose. That's not the purpose of receiving the Holy Ghost. You will prophesy. You will preach. You will evangelize. You will tell sinners the ought to come to the Lord. We will do it in Jesus' name. I said our sisters will do it in Jesus' name. All you are doing is good, but that's not the number one. All you are doing is profitable in the kingdom, in the church, but that's not the number one. The number one is preach the word. Your relatives, bring them to the Lord. Your children, bring them to the Lord. And women around you, bring them to the Lord. Just like the men are zealous and they are passionate about bringing people to the Lord, the women too should be passionate. Evangelism is the work of everyone and the duty of everyone in the church of the living God. We will do it in Jesus' name. We're looking at Joshua. Joshua chapter 2. In Joshua chapter 2, I read from verse 18. Joshua chapter 2, verse 18. Behold, when we come unto the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which, uh, which uh, thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father. We are talking to Rahab, a woman. He said, your father does not know us. You know us. Your father does not know uh, the uh, testimony you have given, that the Lord has given the land to our hand, and we're coming. And you have now said, when we come, we shall spare you, so that you will not perish with those who do not believe. I about your father? I about your mother? about your brethren, Rehab, a woman, you are supposed to take the message unto them. And he said in that verse 18, your father, thy mother, and thy brethren, and all thy father's household come home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless, and whosoever shall be with thee, that is, with, with thee, within the house, his blood shall be upon our head, 
if any hand be upon him. That was the commission that she was given. Oh, she didn't say, I'm a woman. My father will not listen to me. My mother will not listen to me. And they have seen the kind of life I was living before. Now that I come, I come into the midst of the people of God. A change has taken place. I'm expecting total redemption. But if I tell them, they will not hear. Of course, they will hear. When you tell your people, they will hear in Jesus' name. Look at Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 9. Joshua chapter 6, verse 9. And the armed men went before the priests, and that blew with the trumpets. And the rear watch came after the ark, and the priests going up and following with the trumpets. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, he shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, and neither shall any sound proceed out of your mouth until the day that I bid you shout, then shall you shout. That's taking over, conquering Jericho. For the walls to fall down. We're talking about Rahab being a woman. We're talking about Rahab who gave the message of salvation, the message of deliverance to her household, father, mother, brethren, everyone belonging to them. Look at verse 22. And Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and bring out this the woman saved and all that she had father mother brethren she was instrumental to their salvation as she swear unto her and the young man that was spies went in and brought out rehab and her father thank god the father yielded, your father will yield. And her mother, thank God, the mother yielded, your mother will yield. And her brethren, all the brethren, and all that she had, look at that woman, she spoke so persuasively, and she spoke so convincingly, the Israelites are coming. Our city is marked for destruction. There is peril, there is danger. And there is perdition. Everyone in the city, they go to be lost and they go to be destroyed because of their sin. Daddy, come and take shelter. Mommy, come and take shelter. Brethren, come and take shelter. All the people they had, she spoke so persuasively and she spoke so convincingly that they came. All that she had and they brought them out. All the kindred, her kindred, and left them without the camp of Israel, so they will not perish. Our people will not perish. Our relatives will not perish. I'm losing the amen. Look at verse 24. And they burnt the city with fire, and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold, and the vessels of brass and of iron be put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. I pray you'll be a good witness. And I pray that your witness will be acceptable to the people you are talking to in Jesus' name. Come to John chapter 4. John Chapter 4, Reviving Passion for the Lost Among Women. In John chapter 4, we're reading from verse 9. John chapter 4, verse 9. Then says the woman of Samaria unto him, 
how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You see, Jesus was talking to that Samaritan woman. And eventually, she got the message. Eventually, salvation came into her. Eventually, she knew this is the Christ. This is the Messiah. Look at what happened after that. You cannot say, well, I'm not one of the 12 disciples. I'm not an apostle. I'm not the pastor over a local church. I'm just a Christian woman. Verse 28, the woman then left a water pot and went away into the city and says unto the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And then they went out of the city and came unto him, a woman. She also brought the people unto the Lord. Look at the result of her witnessing. Look at the result of her calling the people. Look at it in verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city, many of the Samaritans of that city, men and women, many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. I pray your life will not be a waste. I pray your testimony will not go in vain. Many through you will come to the Lord in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 8. We're reading from verse 3 and verse 4. Acts chapter 8. Reading from verses 3 and 4. For Saul had made, for, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and healing men and women, not only men, his persecution also reach out to women, healing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, because of that persecution, therefore, because of his arresting men and women and hailing them into prison, therefore, they, the men and the women, that were scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the word went everywhere preaching the word as they did it so shall we do we will do it men will not hinder women and women will not fold their hands women will not close their mouths when the lord asks on the final day where are your converts as i show my converts you will show your converts too Reviving passion for the lost among women. Look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consulted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, of the chief women, tell me, of the chief women, tell me, not a few. You see, the women did not say, the salvation is for the men. The soul winning is for the men. The commission is for the men. The promise is only for the men. It's for the men 
and for the women. And all of us will rise up and do what the Lord has called us to in Jesus' name. Number one, recovering the purpose of laboring as watchmen. Number two, reviving passion for the lost among women. Number three now, renewing the power to liberate young witnesses. Renewing the power to liberate young witnesses. Actually, when the prophecy of the coming baptism in the Holy Ghost was first mentioned, the young were also involved. It's not only for the elderly. It's not only for the adults. It's not only for the marriage. It's not only for young adults, young people, even children. Come to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. We're reading from verse 28. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters, young people, shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. If our church is going to be a Bible church, the young men, even the children, they should be getting saved, getting sanctified, being empowered for soul winning, and they should be, they should be part of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. They shouldn't say, we're so busy now, we're trying to make up a profession. We're trying to make up education. We're trying to make up this or that. Let's leave all that evangelism uh, to our fathers and our mothers and to the older ones. You're supposed to receive the Holy Ghost. Our children and our youths and our students will be full of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Let their parents say, Amen. Let the young people say, Amen. God will bless you, young people. I say, God will bless you, young people. As you serve the Lord, the Lord himself will make you come on top in Jesus' name. Look at verse 29. And also, upon my servants and upon my handmaids, in those days will I pour out of my spirit. Let's come to the fulfillment in Acts chapter 2. The fulfillment in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we're reading from verse 16. In verse 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters young people shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams you see that as the lord is giving vision to the young people is giving dreams to the older one and on my servants and on my handmaidens will i pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy, all of them. And they shall proclaim the word, all of them. And they shall preach the gospel, all of them. Look at verse 38. In verse 38, then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 39. For the promise is unto you, adults, and to your children, young people now, and to all that are far off, the Gentiles, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He has called the young, he has called the old, every one of us will respond. Look at Psalm, Psalm 1, 1, 4. Psalm 144. I'm reading here from verse 12. Psalm 144. 
We're reading from verse 12 that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. It's talking about purposeful youth. It's talking about passionate youth. It's talking about preaching youth. And it's talking about boys and girls. And it says they will grow up as plants. They will not just be like great frogs running up and down, running here and there. They will live meaningful lives in the kingdom of God. And our daughters, that they might be as cornerstones, polished after the similitude of a palace. The man himself, David, who said that, who wanted their children, our children, to be as plants growing up and to be as cornerstones in the household of faith, how about he himself? What was he doing when he was younger? Look at Psalm 71. Psalm 71. I'm reading from verse 5. Psalm 71, verse 5. For thou art my hope, O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. Thou art my trust from my youth. We shall bring up our young people. The men are busy for the Lord. The women are busy for the Lord. And the youths too, they are busy for the Lord. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, O God, thou hast taught me from my youth. Thou hast taught me from my youth. It says, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. It said, I didn't wait until I become older and gray-headed before I can tell the word of God, before I can reveal the mind of God unto the people. It says, from my youth who have been teaching me, and hitherto since that time until now, I have declared thy wondrous works. I pray our young people will be like that. Your children will be saved. Children sanctified. Children winning souls and children doing something significant for the Lord in the house of God and in our communities in Jesus' name. A good amen. Not Exodus. I'm looking at Exodus now, chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 2. Exodus chapter 2. We're reading from verse 2. And the woman conceived, this is the mother of Moses, and bare his son. And when he saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and dot it with slime and with peach and put the child therein and she laid it in the flax by the river by the river's brink and his sister young girl remember at this time now that moses um, was a baby three months three months old and the sister about 12 years of age still like, you know, going to teenage years. And his sister stood afar off to see to which what will be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And had made his walk and longer by the river side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her. She sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, three months old. And, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. And then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee? A nurse of the Hebrew women, and she that she may nurse the child for thee. 
Look at that. Just a little girl. Just a teenage girl. Just a youth. Working for the Lord to present the life of Moses. Who will later become the deliverer of the whole of the nation. Our children too can do something. Our boys, our girls can do something. They can present the gospel to the people that they need to hear that they are in contact with, in touch with, and the Lord will bring them into the kingdom in Jesus' name. Don't let your child only be buried in books. Go to school. After school hours, buried in books, buried in books, bookworms. Or maybe you send them, go and sell granules, go and sell this, go and sell that. Let them also take part in the training of the youth so that they will have the gospel, they will be confident in the gospel, and they will preach the gospel in Jesus' name. Let the parents give me a good amen. amen. And then in verse 9, or oh sorry, in verse 8, and Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Go. And the maid went and called. Who did the maid go to the child go to call? I said, Who did she go to call? Wisdom. She had wisdom. Our children will have wisdom. She didn't say, Can I go and call the mother for you? No. Can I call a Hebrew nurse that knows about the Hebrews and then that can nurse the child for you? And she said, Go. And she went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse this child for me, and I will give thee thy wages. She was even paid for taking care of her own child. And the woman took the child and nursed it, nursed the child, and the child grew. And she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, because I drew him out of the water. Well, the whole story shows, uh, you know, the father of Moses was not even involved in all this deal. The daughter and the mother, the girl and the mother, the woman and the, and the girl, they were involved in this and were responsible. Even Pharaoh's daughter, a woman, to raise Moses as a deliverer for the people of Israel. God will use our mothers. God will use our teenage boys and girls in Jesus' name. I'm coming to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. Look at what happened here. We're talking about God using young people, boys and girls, girls and boys. You've seen them, not only, you know, that they pass exams good, not only that they pass from secondary high school and they go to college, university, that's good, but that they are also working you know, for God, also telling the gospel, also sharing the gospel, also preaching the gospel. Second Kings chapter 5, verse 1. Now Naaman, the captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captives out of the land of, um, of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the people, with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Look at the situation here. This little girl, 
did what even the prophet could not do. The prophet could not come to the land of Syria and come and pray and minister for, to Naaman. Neither could a king do that. Neither could anybody do that. She was in a strategic position as a maid, as a little girl. And then she said, if my master, my lord, while well, the prophet is Samaria, he will be cured of the leprosy. And, he, and one went in and told his lord, saying, thus and thus says the maid, that is of the land of Israel. You know the story? Eventually, Naaman went. And eventually, Naaman was killed because of the ministry, because of the soul winning, because of the sharing, and because of the testimony of this little girl. I pray God will do that through us and through our children. And they will excel for the Lord in Jesus' name. We're coming to, G to Jeremiah. Jeremiah now. And I'm reading from chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. In Jeremiah chapter 1, we're reading from verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 6. Then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak from a child. The Lord called Jeremiah when he was still very young, and he said, but I cannot, I'm just a child. There are older people than myself. Why don't you send them? But the Lord said unto me, say not, I'm a child, but thou shalt go to all that I will send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid, our children will not be afraid. I said our children will not be afraid. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. The Lord will put his word in the mouth of her children, all our young people, all the boys and girls, your own children, your own boys, your own girls, your sons and your daughters, in Jesus' name. They will excel. There are children that represent our country in football. They represent our country in ICT, in doing uh, this and that. And they come back and they say that they have excelled. Our own children will excel in the number one work the Lord has put in the hand of the church in Jesus' name. Second Timothy chapter 1. In Second Timothy chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, unpretending faith, sincere faith, transparent faith, solid faith that is in thee, in the Timothy, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice. And I am sure, I'm persuaded, I'm convinced that in thee also, that is in thee also. The grandmother at the faith passed it to her own daughter, that's the mother, and the daughter now passed it on to her own son, Timothy. And even though the fathers were not even, like in this particular case, responsible, yet those women did not say, well, women, what can we do? Pass the faith on, pass the courage on, pass the conviction on to the children, and they will take the touch of the gospel. They will run with it in Jesus' name. Second Timothy chapter 3, and we're reading verse 14 and verse 15. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child, from a child, from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. 
Those uh, people in the in Bible days, they trained their children to love the Lord. They trained their children to know the scriptures. They trained their children to present the scriptures to other people. They trained their children to live for God and to live confidently. We, in these days, we're going to do the same. And as we do, the Lord will honor what we do for our children. And our children will honor us back. And they will represent Christ victoriously, successfully, profitably, passionately in Jesus' name. In by Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. We're reading from verse 6. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. You want them saved? Train up a child in the way of salvation. You want them sanctified? Train up a child in the way of sanctification. You want them to be righteous and holy? Train up a child in the way of righteousness and godliness. You want them to be effective, passionate, courageous, bold, soul winners? Train the child up in the way of soul winning. If you teach them and you don't release them to go out and demonstrate what they have learned, they're not going to show that they have learned anything. Train up a child in the way he should go. You want them to be transparent. You want them to be dependable. You want them to be faithful. Train up the children then to be honest to be transparent, to be faithful, train up a child in the way he should go. You want him to love what he loves. You want him to give his heart, his attention, his passion, to want to give your attention and passion to train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. The Lord has spoken to us today on the burden of bringing precious souls to the Lord we men, we will do our part. Women, you will do your part. And our young witnesses and young children, boys and girls, they will do their part in Jesus' name. And when the trumpet shall sound, father, mother, son, daughter, church, we all go with the Lord in Jesus' name. As uh, fathers are receiving reward, women will be receiving rewards, boys and girls, young people will be receiving their rewards as well in Jesus' name. And when we get to heaven, we're getting there. I said you are getting there. We and our children will not go empty-handed, will not say it's just a boy, it's just a girl. No boy will go empty-handed. No girl will go empty-handed. No mother, no wife, no sister will go empty-handed. No young man, no brother, and uh, no pastor, no preacher will go empty-handed in Jesus' name. What have you done for the Lord since you became born again? And what have you done for your family? How are you moving on? What passion do you have? What purpose do you have? Let's rise up now and take this to the Lord and say, Lord, we know you have called us now, and we know what you have called us to do. We are going to do this work the way it ought to be done, not leaving anybody behind, men, women, boys, girls, young people, children. We will run around and will take the torch of the gospel, send the light of the gospel everywhere. We will do it in Jesus' name. I said you will do it in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.